Get your attention, please. We're just started. Uh, next up is Mark Corn with Alpha Systems Angle Attack. He spoke last year. Unfortunately, he spoke next door where I was landing this room here, so I get to hear his talk this year. Uh, Mark's a, uh, an inventor, he's a mayor, and more importantly, he's a pilot. And as his name tag says, AOA Wizard, he told me he didn't give himself that name, but others have given him that name because he's been in the business for 19 years. Mark Horn, thank you. Well, thanks for that introduction. Um, I travel around the United States. I get asked to go around and talking to pilots about what angle of attack is. I do own the Alpha Systems product line today. Hopefully I've got a lot of stuff here. We've got questions at the end. If there's something quick that you're not, I'm not being clear on, um, usually when I do these presentations, I can look at people and they're going like this. Or they're sleeping. Today is not going to be one of those days. I've got some flashlights that I'm going to give you. I'm going to keep you entertained. I'm going to have you guys open your mouth, I think, by the end of the show or by the end of the presentation of what angle of attack is. So as we go forward here, I think you'll get the gist of what's going on. Can you turn these lights down a little bit? Is that okay, guys? Gals? People? Okay, first of all, I really appreciate everybody. Yeah, one light's fine. I really do appreciate, honestly, um, talking about what angle of attack is. How many, when we'll get into this, but. Um, when I go through slides, and I, I see a lot of stuff over my many years of being involved in aviation and aviation product design and going to all the trade shows and all the presentations that I do, and this picture really looks cool, but there's something wrong. I have a flashlight for somebody that can look at this picture and tell me, besides him sticking his hand out the window, what's wrong with that picture? Angle of attack on the who said that? You got it. Right here, see if I can do this now. Right here, do you see that angle of attack vein? Notice how it's not in the direction of flight? It's sitting on the ground. Very good catch. I threw it to him. Come on. Okay. The second flashlight is going to go to somebody, the first person that can say this. Come on, you guys are old enough to know this guy. Who? No. Older. He wrote this because the FAA wrote him up. No, close. Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Okay. You're probably wondering who is this big guy standing in front of you. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of my background. I'll go through this pretty quick. I own, I am the president and CEO of Depot Star, which we do engineering and manufacturing. Mainly, my background is a medical device design engineer. I started out in the late 70s, early 80s, working for Medtronic and Johnson & Johnson and became a design engineer and uh, a engineering manager over the years. And um, so, uh, I started my company in 1996. I am also the mayor for the city of Oak Grove. Any Oak Grove residents in here, I have to bow to you and say nice things. Um, and no, you don't have to call me the Honorable, even though if you want to, you can. Um, and speaking of that, I get letters addressed to me as the Honorable Mark Corrin, mayor for the city of Oak Grove. And you'd think I'd get some something 
for being the mayor as long as I have, but I go to TSA and I get strip searched every single time I go through. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is. I've had 30 years of product development and management in all kinds of different um, fields. Uh, I'm an inventor. I actually have a number of patents both in the medical field and aviation and uh, I have a, a number of other products that we're working on. Angle of Attack is basically a product that I am very, very passionate about and you'll see why going forward here. On the, on the aviation side, I'm a VFR pilot. I was working on my IFR rating, but business and, and uh, my, my desire for angle of attack came first. Um, I've been in this for over 19 years now. I bought the rights to the product 19 years ago, and I kept refining and refining and refining this. I've also, though, have taken this to a level that is beyond normal. I've collected over 100 different patents articles uh, from the 1920s till today and I've collected over 150 different uh, displays, transmitters, senders, computers, air data computers, stick shakers, you name it, I've taken it and I've taken every one apart. AOA is an obsession to me. <laughs> Maybe it has something to do with my first flight. And I'll tell you something folks, first, Let's get into who you folks are so I can kind of tailor. Uh, how many military pilots here? Military people, retired. current and retired. Thank you for your service, gentlemen. I, I do sincerely. We actually give an extra 3% discount to all military pilots or reserve, um, any military, whether you're a pilot or um, uh, currently in the military or retired. Um, so commercial pilots, okay. Uh, instructors, CFIs, you guys are going to keep me honest, okay, you gals, make sure I don't lie. Uh, general aviation pilots, just for fun, having a great time, okay, great. Any FAA officials here, I need to know who I can lie to and not, okay. AMPs, IAs, I came back from 250 IAs out in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, three weeks ago, and I gave this presentation out there. And um, it actually, I could see, because they're the ones that put it in, they hear pilots coming to them going, what the heck is this AOA thing? I've never had it. If it's not in the airplane, it can't go in there afterwards, right? You, you hear that all the time. But we've designed a product that allows that to happen as a minor alteration. Is there anybody else in here that I want to uh, talk about? How about NSA? Any NSA people? Okay. I, I, I really do love our government. Just. Okay, we're going to get started this way. I want to ask everybody, and be honest, how many of you have done something stupid while you're flying the airplane? You know, you're the first, you didn't raise your hand. Okay, okay. You're the first crowd that actually raised their hand, almost, almost every one of you did. That's my son in my first airplane back in 1980. I had an ultralight, it was called a B1RD. We used to go flying tree levels, you know, it was just great. Unfortunately, I did the worst thing possible. You're looking at a guy that should be dead. I buried that engine two feet into the ground. I stalled it out at 100 feet off the ground. I had an engine failure at 1,500 feet. I circled around over a bunch of trees and houses, and this is the second time I've ever actually come out in public and, and, and said this. Um, the impact of, the, of, the, uh, of my body with my five-point harness came up through the main root tube that went through uh, right up through this area here. That was a four inch by four inch solid, or, uh, quarter inch thick aluminum tube. That half inch bolt, because of my impact, ripped through that root tube. Kind of see some, how big that root tube is. That, when I came to, I was underneath that wing. That airplane was dripping fuel on me. I was knocked unconscious for, for about 15 minutes. Uh, when I came to, I had a broken hip, two sprained ankles. Uh, my eye, one eye was doing something really weird, but all in all, I was alive. 
and I refused to tell the hospital what I fell from. So uh, <laughs> I was really ashamed. But you know what? That one, I had it, I had the landing nailed until I did something stupid. It was that split second decision. You know what instruments I had in that thing? An air, uh, a uh, RPM and an altimeter. Those are the two instruments. I, I, I could feel that airplane. That there's nobody that could feel that airplane better than me. So I thought. I was, I was inside right here when I came to the, my seat sideways. So I'll kind of tell you how, how I lived through this. And I didn't know about AOA back then because, man, we got in the airplanes and we took off, right? Uh, I got my VFR license later in life. My wife said, if you're going to do this now, you better go do it legit. So I went and got my VFR ticket. I was learning how to fly. I, mean, I actually had three L-29 Delphins. That's how wacky I am. And uh, I was rebuilding those in my shop until I redesigned the AOA. What we're going to get out of this is what is angle of attack, history of angle of attack, about AOA's use in the military and commercial, why the benefits of AOA over airspeed, general aviation AOA systems, and basically it's to, when you leave this room, if you don't have a better sense of AOA, regardless of whether or not you buy our product or anybody's AOA out there, I hope the next time you get in your airplane you'll start realizing what we're going to talk about in today's um, presentation. I don't, where's your clock right there? I have until when? Okay. This was done in 1957, and I'm not going to let you guys go through it. If you want to see these videos, by the way, you can go out to our website. You can watch the full thing, okay? I download as much information as I possibly can. Um, and they get into classroom discussion and windfoil and uh, airfoil discussions on what angle of attack is. That's why I put this in here. When I do these presentations, usually I let everybody go through this whole, uh, most of it, the first six minutes. But we don't have time. But if you do want to see it, you uh, can go on our website. Okay. Basically, what is angle of attack? It's a, the shape is designed to create a force and reaction to the air or fluid. So as the air goes over the wing or below the wing, the rounded leading edge basically splits that air, air flow and it divides it in, the tangent into, um, into two air flows. Uh, um, the cord basically is the length of the airfoil and the cord line passes through the leading edge to the trailing edge. That's the definition of the, of the um, uh, cord line of the, um, of the wing itself. So the re reaction forces, the result from the changes in air velocity and the pressure passing over the airfoil, which is Bernoulli's law. As velocity increase, increases, pressure decreases. The vertical component is lift. The horizontal component is drag. So what we're going to do is measuring or what, and let me back up. Before I go further, how many people believe that your airplane will always stall at the same angle of attack? Nobody? Yes, it will. It will, every airplane designed, every airplane will always stall at the same angle of attack, regardless of airspeed. And that's what we're going to, yeah, by the end of this, presentation you'll understand. Maybe I didn't say it clearly. Every airplane always stalls at the same angle of attack. How many people believe you can stall your airplane at 300 knots? Okay, yeah, see. Well, that's what I mean. So the angular difference between the chord line of the relative wind is the angle of attack. So basically it's the chord line here to relative wind that hits that that wing is seen. Besides mass airflow over that wing or under it, AOA also causes changes of lift and drag, both generally increasing with the angle of attack. So at 10 degrees, it's 
it, the airfoil has enough um, connected air, full, air flow over the top of the wing. As you keep increasing the angle of attack, the airflow starts to separate from the tail first, and as you build, it goes all the way to the, the leading edge, and then the airflow has the air flow, the airfoil, thank you, uh, the airfoil doesn't have enough lift to maintain controlled flight. I got into an argument with a flight instructor that flies um, extra 300 airplanes, and he said to me, your system doesn't work. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't work? He said, well, it works up to a stall, but I want something to show me beyond a stall. I can pull my extra and fly it by the thrust of that prop, right? Well, what is the definition of angle of attack? It's the airflow over the wing, the wing flying the airplane. It's not the thrust from the prop, and the wing then becomes the stability portion that controls the airplane. So, basically, does everybody understand this principle so far? It's pretty straightforward, it's ground school stuff. Any, everybody? Okay. So, basically, let's talk about the PA-46. That's one of my newest, biggest customer bases. Um, the PA-46 stalls at 16 degrees, but can be different from aircraft to aircraft. And the reason I say that is, from model to model, the angle of attack will change based on the design of the wing, the slight differences in that cord or the, the full area of that wing. Everything you'll see with me is P-51 related. I tell everybody I'm a reincarnated P-51 pilot. So um, that's why you'll see a lot of P-51 stuff up here. There's a difference too, folks. Angle of attack is different than angle of incidence. The angle of incidence essentially is the center line of the aircraft to the wing, the cord line, as you're flying in that direction. The angle of attack, it, the difference is the direction of flight here to the wings, the cord of the wing attacking that direction of flight. So I had a real hard time uh, over the years, and I'm going to step over here. Is this okay for everybody? Okay, over the years, you always you open up your pilot ground school books, and you see these pictures, these really nice pictures in the, in the books, right, that show this. So then I thought, why don't I pull that out? Direction of flight, every airplane has an alpha range from cruise, right? As you pull the stick back, if you're going in that direction, your angle of attack is increasing. You'll get to a particular point that no matter if you're going straight down this direction or whatever, you're still stalled. Does everybody understand that? you hear the difference, what is relative wind versus direction of flight? Well, when I show you the demonstration of our system, angle of attack, every airplane has a linear range from cruise all the way to stall. If you have relative wind that hits that wing, how many people have flown in turbulence? That's instantaneous changes of relative wind hitting your aircraft. That's why you're going up and down and, tur and bouncing all around. That's instantaneous changes of relative wind hitting that, that, um, that, or that wing. Does everybody follow me? Okay. So what I did was I figured if everybody understands what angle of attack is then, the direction of flight, and if you're flying in cruise, that's a real low angle of attack. As you start to pitch back, you start transitioning through a calibrated Love. readout. Every pilot operating handbook has the 1.3 V sub S, or a 30% margin away from stall. Every pilot operating handbook I've ever seen. If you can calibrate an optimum alpha. Getting low. Let me turn that off. Uh, um, if you can calibrate optimum alpha and then you can identify where 
where in the red you are just before a stall, now you have that linear range from stall. Optimum alpha, which is 30% margin away from stall, all the way VX, VY, all the way to cruise. It's that simple. I wish I could stand up here in front of you folks and say, I invented this. I didn't invent the concept of angle of attack. I wish I had. I didn't invent the differential pressure system that we currently use. The US military did in 1950. I've got the, the paperwork to show it. What I did is I took this hunk of coal and I saw something shiny in it. And because of my love of flying and because of my love of creating products as a design engineer, we took that over 19 years and made this current product. So as we go forward, I can pass this around if you guys want to play with it from the distance. Go ahead. As I talk, you can go through. See, I just forced you to do something you didn't want to do. But it keeps you awake, doesn't it? Okay. The reason I put this up here is notice how they always talk about airspeed, but they also correlate they always they correlate to what angle of attack is. So Again, as you increase your angle of attack, the stall speed varies with weight density, altitude, bank angle, CG. At a 2G maneuver, that's a 60 degree bank angle, right? You need 1.44 times the airspeed to get the same amount of lift. But if you keep increasing power to make sure that that donut is on, you're always 30% margin away from, it's all about lift. It has nothing to do with airspeed. I've got a question for you, and the first one that says yes or no, does flap, do flaps affect angle of attack? Yes or no. <laughs> oh, comedian too. Who said that? <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> you're right. It may or may not. It will definitely affect airspeed. It may or may not change the angle of attack. And what I mean by that, in, in over the years, I'm sorry, I, I can't figure out, I wonder if I can turn this on. Audio off. There. Okay, now you can play with it all you want. Um, over the years, I always believed that everybody that told me said that when you put flaps in, it changes the angle of attack. Really, if you look at the surface area, the total surface area of the wing, compared to the surface area of the flaps, they actually act more like speed brakes. In a lot of airplanes that we put our angle of attack system on and gone up and flown with, or flown with those pilots, some of them have a minor offset, some of them do not. So we always tell customers to calibrate clean, um, and I'll go through this real quick, but calibrate clean because it's the worst case lift of the wing. Uh, eight years ago, I had my bucket wish come, come true. I got a ride in that P-51 Mustang, $2.2 million. It was called Lady Alice, and by the way, I did get stuck getting out of the buckets uh, of her seat. And my daughter happened to show this, so. And she put this in my PowerPoint. Um, so, every aircraft wing has an alpha range from cruise, the lowest alpha, all the way to stall, which is the highest angle of attack that an airplane can achieve, or what's called critical alpha. As we go forward here, here's a bunch more charts, and I don't want to get into this because I'll bore you half to death, but you have a lift over drag or lift to drag ratio curve, you have a coefficient of drag, and basically the separation install or CL max, the peak of that lift curve, and that theoretically is where you'd stall. What we try to do is that a, a, to identify right at the peak of that lift curve, that correlates to 1.3 V sub S, or a 30% margin away from stall. How many people have seen an aircraft carrier landing? You know, pictures, you know, airplanes coming in. Do you notice that they pitch to the donut or they fly the donut on approach? In their AOA, they have an AOA right there. That donut is 1.3 V sub S. They use thrust to increase or decrease their descent rate. 
but they always keep that safe margin of lift knowing, and it's also for the tail hook, see nobody caught me there, but it's also for tail hook position. But in the most case, it's for identifying the right angle of attack for approach. In all commercial and military airplanes, those AOA indexers on the dash are called or, uh, mission specific indexers. They have one purpose, you pitch to the donut, and too red is too slow, yellow is too fast. That's, what it, that's why they call it, right on speed, too slow, too fast. Yeah, well, it depends. Are you uh, Navy or Air Force? The, believe it or not, the Air Force and the Marines can't even I, get the same color indexers. The donuts on some are green, on others they're yellow, and the, and the um, Marines are blue. So, um, why fly at AOA? It's one point we can identify very safe margin away from stall for perfect approach. It's weight adjusted final approach speed for optimum balance, adequate safety margin away from stall, and it's consistent for stabilized approaches. How many of you in flight instructors try to get your students to do stabilized approach? Do you? Right? How do you get them to do that? If you pitch to a known angle of attack and use thrust to increase or decrease your descent rate, you'll always have a controlled descent and a controlled margin of lift. Having too much airspeed correlates to lift can be as dangerous as not enough. You know what I mean by that? Coming in too fast, you might roll off the end of the runway or balloon up before you bleed off that lift and smash back into the runway. This was 1945 and there's a lot of old actors in here. This whole 15 minute video is all about discussion on what angle of attack is. Believe it or not. So if you want to see this, we don't have time to show you the whole thing here. But if you want to see the whole video, you can go on my line. But it's really cool because they're talking about angle of attack, but they really don't connect the pilots um, what angle of attack is. They know what it is, but then they always revert back to airspeed, which is it, it, it's so weird to me. That's Cary Grant. Can you hear? before they had an angle of attack system. They're teaching what angle of attack is. Okay, so if you want to see more, I'm sorry for pushing you guys, but we got a lot to go through here. So what's the big deal? Why are you wasting your time listening to me? I hear this all the time. I've been flying my airplane for 30 years. I've got 30,000 hours. Why do I need airplane or angle of attack? I feel the airplane. You know guys, I've been accused by the FAA in California of making flying too simple. Honestly, when you go through and, and I start giving you the connections here, how many pilots currently fly with the principles of angle of attack? Who? That's right, you get a flashlight. These are worth 25 bucks by the way. So it pays attention. Okay, every pilot in this room flies with the principles of angle of attack. We have that stupid airspeed indicator that kind of tells you 
what the range, the assessed range, or the appropriate or the approximate range of angle of attack is. But you have to do the mental calisthenics to add for gross weight, add for gramma, subtract for fuel, density altitude. All of those things will change the airspeed, but your angle of attack is absolute. I could care less whether you're flying at max gross weight or minimum weight. It doesn't change angle of attack. Are you missing your approach? You know, I got into an argument with Garmin's design engineering team about 10 years ago. And they said, everything that you need, a pilot needs is in that screen. The PFD is, the, is where the pilots need to be focused. And I said, wrong. Wrong. The place that you need a pilot's view is out over the windshield. Every single system that I sell, if they tell me they're going to put it down in the lower cockpit, I tell them I won't sell it to them. Because if they think it's a gadget or a gimmick or a backup, I tell them, well, you're, you don't understand what, what really you're getting in your airplane. Every single pilot that's ever put one of my products in, if it doesn't change the way you fly, my promise is I'll buy it back. I've never bought one back in my life in 19 years. That's my promise. Keep your head out of the cockpit, whether you're rolling down the runway, whether you're maneuvering, whether you're coming in. That's the last place you want your focus is in the cockpit, unless you're doing an IFR approach. Let me tell you a very quick story. My life changed about 12 years ago when I was at Oshkosh and a lady was dragging her husband up to the booth in front of me. And she was pushing all the people away from me. Um, and, and there was like 20 people in front and that's when I just had me in front of the booth and all that. And this lady drags her husband up and says, tell him, tell him what happened. And I'm thinking the worst, right? I mean, that's the, in front of 20 people, he sticks his hand out and says, I want to shake the hand of the guy that invented something that helped me save my life. And all the 20 people thought it was a setup. They, they looked at me like, yeah, right. So this guy told a story that he was on an IFR uh, approach and he hit a goose in a rainstorm. rainstorm. Took his engine out, broke the propeller, the body hit the pedal probe. Because the AOA is a separate system, he pitched to the, in, in his system, it was just an LED, a blue LED, and he continued on his glide slope. Fortunately, he had already set up the path and he was right on the end of the runway. He said to those 20 people in the crowd, I did a better landing with no instruments, no engine in a rainstorm than I've ever done with any of the other instruments in my airplane. I want to thank you personally for, for sticking with this product and making the best product you can. And that kind of told me how, if I can do that just one time, I can, I can have a small part of bringing products as an engineer to help a community, the aviation community. So to be most effective though, the AOA indicators must be in the pilot's peripheral vision on top of the glare shield. You don't want to look at it, you want to look through it. How many flight instructors say fly the airplane, scan your instruments? Fly your airplane, scan your instruments. You got to get out of that routine. AOA, all those other instruments are, are important, but if you're doing an approach, if you're doing banking turns, if you're looking for other airplanes in the pattern, if you're doing all those things, the place you want to be focused is outside of the, the airplane. If you can put an AOA just like they do in the commercial, and there's the AOA right there in the military, why do you think the military puts it right in the middle of the pilot's view? Because he's forced to look through it. So, as we kind of showed here with that, with our uh, tabletop display, on a low angle of attack you get the green, a higher, slightly higher, so you, we're giving you trending information with this display. The peak of the lift curve essentially shows you that blue donut, which is 1.3 or 30% margin of, uh, uh, above stall, and then 
the red here will show you uh, stall. So the theory is that because you have a probe that's mounted underneath your wing or in your nose or somewhere in clean air, you get ram air and ram air as you fly through the air and you change your angle of attack, if you can correlate that differential pressure information to your airplane, now you have a readout that's absolutely going to give you that real-time AOA information. Same thing with the bar graph. As you transition up through the scale, each one of those separate LEDs would turn on and you get closer and closer. So you get trending information the closer you get to the blue. Then once you get past the peak of that lift curve, now you're starting to sink and you'll stall somewhere down in the red. So here's a, a good indication of what, what happens here. Just kind of give you a, a generalization. You get to the peak and you're starting to sink. And you stall right at the end of that red junction. Very simply put, have you got lift? How much lift do you have? As your AOA increases, your margin of lift, available lift above stall, decreases appropriately or proportionately. All pilots are managing the appropriate amount of lift throughout every phase of flight. Rollouts, takeoffs, climbs, crews, touchdowns, banking maneuvers, descents, and stalls. AOA is not just to identify a stall. Just because you have a stall tab, that's one point at an angle of attack. So if your stall switch always comes on right there, that's great. But how is that going to tell you that, that you have uh, that range above and below that point to be where you're stalled. Let's see if I can do this. There's the, is that the donut? Okay, that's 1.3. So if you're going to do your banking maneuvers, you just add or subtract power to increase or decrease your descent rate. Is this uh, sinking in a little bit? Is it, am I making sense to everybody? I hope I'm not boring you. In 1907, Wilbur Wright we can put a vein on to show our angle of incidence. He didn't know it was called, or he didn't, they didn't define it as angle of attack back then. At six or seven degrees and climb without any attempt of estimating um, or looking at the ground. You know what it was? It was a string on a, on a stick and he had a protractor. So as he flew through the air, that string kept relative or direction of flight, and the aircraft rotated and showed him how much what his angle of attack was. So in ground school, AOA is discussed. The FAA exam has five questions typically on AOA, but when you get into flight, what's the first thing your flight instructors tell you? Pull out your, your, your pilot operating handbook and tell me how much airspeed you need to climb out to miss that 50 foot obstacle with this gross weight, this much fuel, density, altitude. Hey, I'm not saying that it's not important for pilot operating or understanding your cockpit workload, uh, doing reoccurrence flight training with the qualified flight instructors. That's extremely important. But what angle of attack does is it connects now directly with what, um, with what all pilots are flying. So airspeed issues, obviously airspeed correction tables for uh, gross weight, pilots, passengers, fuel, density, altitude, bank angles. Let me tell you this. Right now, I'm going to tell you, you're not flying airspeed. You're flying what airspeed represents, which is AOA. This is one of the most important videos you're going to watch today. Did you see what happened? That inside wing 
stalled out. And what happened? That outside wing was still flying. That wing dropped over, he rolled over and right into the ground. Is that because it wasn't a controlled He was just coming in too high of an angle of attack. That, that's, he was, yeah, he was doing a control. But the main thing was, let, let me back up here just for, he was sliding in, yeah. You want to see it again or is that okay? Okay. Now, I need to know, I need somebody to tell me, the, I've got one left. What airplane is this? Nope. Nope. Listen here. It's got the don't. Or it's got the. It flies strictly on AOA. Any other? Listen. You got it. You too. About eight years ago, I met a guy at Oshkosh, and he has the same, same well, 10 years ago now. Um, he has the same passion, and uh, he's a flight instructor for the U-2 program, now retired after, after three years. His name is Major John Cabigas. He teaches pilots still how to fly the U-2. Because he's retired, they don't let him up in the airplane anymore. But I have videos of him flying the T-38s, and I have all of his AOA. And he comes to my booth. Matter of fact, we're heading out to Sun and Fun here together uh, to do a week-long uh, presentation. I'm doing this presentation down to uh, three different times at Sun and Fun and then at Oshkosh, too. But there I have these great big trade shows with big wings on it and stuff. I'm sorry, guys, but all my stuff is in a crate right now headed to Florida. So normally I have this great big presentation but I'm kind of letting you down. Um, all military and all commercial airplanes have and must have their AOA working or they're grounded. All the military stuff, this is a Teledyne system. This is actually a, a transmitter and it stays in relative wind. It has two slots and those two slots are enough to keep that in, in the relative wind. And then the airplane or this part here rotates one direction or the other. But that cone is no different. Yeah, and okay, we'll get into this too. All the military systems and all the commercial systems also have AOA information, airspeed from the pitot probe, static pressure, temperature probe, um, the configuration of the aircraft wing, um, all sensor data fed, fed into the computer's flight system. These are different um, AOA systems, relative wind, relative wind, relative wind. That cone is no different than those. They're either old potentiometers or rotary inductors internal to that system. There's my, one of my good friends, John Cabigas. This lady here is Lane Wallace. Remember when she did that article in Flying Magazine? He was the pilot that took her up. He is the coolest guy you could ever meet. Uh, I'm just totally impressed. This is a uh, uh, Garmin probe, um, no different than ours, only they're using RAM air in both of these ports. Here's your RAM air port and the differential 45 port. So they're measuring RAM and RAM, or the delta between those two ports. Um, our system, again, is uh, RAM air here, RAM air here, and we just calibrate the AOA or the delta between those two ports to your airplane or yours or to yours. The leading edge lift detector. This is funny. Safe Flight uses that, you know, a lot of people, you guys have seen this as a stall switch, right? On the leading edge of most people's airplanes. This one actually has um, a, uh, this one actually has a, uh, a range so this is mounted in the leading edge, and then as you pitch the wing back, more and more air hits this tab, so it measures the change in that smaller range. You know what they call this? This is called a lift transducer. It's fed into the lift computer. Then they have an indicator in 1962 that was called fast and slow. I don't get it either. This is called the bacon saver. A lot of ultralights have this, but it, essentially it's an angle of attack, just like the Wright brothers used to have. Another one. 
Why AOA over airspeed? Because military reduced their fatalities by 50% in 1953. 50%. According to the Nall report, 80% of all fatalities happen in two places, base to final, slow flight, or accelerated stalls at climb out. AOA indicators are slow to respond. 40% of all pilots that have had accidents had over 2,000 hours. I get pilots that buy our angle of attack systems apologizing to me. They go, well, you know, I've flown my airplane for 25,000 hours. I'm ex-military, I'm ex-commercial. I love flying, but I want something extra in that airplane. And I go, you're one of the smartest guys I know. Because every pilot in this room raised their hand and said they did something stupid. We can't prevent pilots from doing something stupid. We can show you before you're going to do it. That's the most important thing. I really believe that every airspeed indicator should be ripped out of every airplane and thrown in the garage. <clears throat> airspeed indicators are only accurate in a 1G maneuver, right? In a 2G maneuver, you need to do the mental calisthenics to add more airspeed to get the same amount of lift. So, let's do this correlation very quickly. Do I still have a little bit of time? Okay, I'm almost done. So, I, I do this, usually I bring a, everybody knows this is an automobile cluster, right? And in a car, the air or the the uh, speedometer here is absolute. You put your foot, uh, foot on the throttle, and you know how fast you're going. Try covering up the speedometer once, and you can kind of tell how fast you're going by the position of your foot, the feel of the throttle, um, and by your your tachometer. I know that if I'm doing about 1,800 RPM, I know I'm roughly doing 55 miles an hour, right? If, as long as I know huh, what gear I'm in, am I in overdrive, those factors will change using your tachometer. To me, in a car, the, the miles per hour, the speedometer, is no different than an angle of attack system. In other words, it's absolute in a car. In an airplane, the AOA indicator is an absolute indicator of available lift that a pilot has. With, an air, with a tachometer in a car, you can kind of tell, but it's approximate, just like an airspeed indicator is. And I want you to think about three things here very quickly. How many people have an airspeed indicator in their airplane? Everybody better raise their hand. When was the last time you had your airspeed indicator calibrated from zero accurate at every readout? Anybody? No. The FAA requires an airspeed indicator to be in every airplane flying, but there's no required calibration protocol to verify that it's accurate over the entire range. Here's questions for you. There's only four reasons you really, truly need an airspeed indicator in your airplane. And I'm gonna go through this really quick. One, the FAA tells you you have to. It's a mandated primary flight system. When to put your gear down? When to put your flaps down? Can you see? I'll get out of your way. Okay. Uh, v and E, never to exceed. Two, three, and four are aircraft structural limitations. They have nothing to do with flying your airplane. They're structural. In other words, let's go back here. Two, three, and four are all about structural limitations to that airplane. What you're doing through airspeed indicator is identifying the right amount of lift throughout any phase of flight. Now I'm not gonna, how many people always fly in a 10,000 foot runway? Anybody? Same airport, landing, takeoffs, uh, approach base to final at a stall airspeed, anybody? How about at cruise speed? Anybody? Do you ever fly with anybody else in the pattern? Have you ever had to come in at minimum lift? Just for thought, on climb out to miss, miss a 50 foot um, mythical obstacle 
how many pilots have ever pulled back that stick and then looked down at their airspeed indicator hoping it didn't bleed down? Come on, am I the only one that's done that? Really? No, see, okay. So we, we actually have a cash for clunkers program. If they turn in our competitors products, we give them discounts to buy ours. Um, there's different systems out there, Dynan, Advanced Flight Systems, Safe Flight came out with one, Garmin, um, and the Bendix King. How many have heard of the Bendix King KLR-10? That's that egg there, have you heard about it? We make that, that's our product. They put their name on our product. The Valkyrie, we actually have a heads up glass adapter that you can see up here. And we have eight different displays. All of the FAA's new regulations, the F-39 and the ASTM standards, I was on that board and they wrote that specification on our products, on our company's product. The Alpha Systems AOA again just replaces an inspection cover. Um, it's a solid probe, standalone system. It's a minor alteration, logbook entry by any AMP. It's less than a quarter amp and I'll just go through this really quick. It can mount either in the nose, like down at the bottom there, um, or in any inspection cover. So you just cut the plate to fit. Um, we have pressurized systems. Now we can actually drive four displays from one AOA system. And the new systems that we're working with Mitsubishi Heavy Industrial, have anybody heard of the MU2, Mitsubishi MU2? They picked our product um, to go in as a replacement STC safety device in that airplane. Liberty University is flying almost 40 of our systems. Um, let's see, let's keep going here. I don't want to bore you to death. AOA is a sa safer way to fly. It's more accurate than airspeed, accurate in a bank, instantaneous, wind shear. Look, I just wrecked it. Yeah, the wind shear. <laughs> How did I do that? <laughs> well, uh, see, I bet you I'm done anyways, aren't I? Okay, well, let's see. Let me just go down to the end here really quick, folks. Oh, sorry, I can't do that. Okay, well, does anybody have any questions? Did I bore you to death? Was it worth sticking up? I really do sincerely appreciate you listening to me and thanks for taking the time. Do you have one question quick? Yeah, one question. Sure. Well, that's a really, that's really an important question. How does ice affect the wing? Depending on what type of ice, how it builds up, you cannot identify the, the coefficient of lift change with any amount of ice on the wing. We have a heated probe option so that if you, if you get um, ice on your wing, um, I was taught, and don't yell at me if I was taught wrong, but for every inch of ice build up on my wing, you add five knots, kind of as a safety minimum. So if your stall is 60, for every inch back, your stall would be 65, 70, 75, and so on as a safety margin. With angle of attack, we do the same thing. If the donut is safe or a 30% margin with one inch back, the bottom of the arc is safe. So in other words, we, we edge back. The heated probe just allows the system to continue to function until you can get out of ice. Well, again, folks, thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Mark.